Welcome to another edition of Fixing the Money Thing. We're Gary and Drinda Kasi, and today on Fixing the Money Thing, you're gonna see a picture of what I believe is probably the most dramatic picture of what the power of God can do. A young woman having a tumor made her look almost seven months pregnant, instantly healed by the power of God. Amazing photograph. It is. It's actually one of the greatest miracles I've ever seen, so stay with us. I'm Gary Kasi, and for nine years we lived in a financial, chaotic, stress-filled, visionless life. I cried out to God. He said, you're living like many of my people are, living in debt. He said, I want my people free. Your financial freedom is closer than you think. America's financial coach, Gary Cassie, shares the kingdom principles that changed his life, defeated his debt, and set him free. Financial problems, they're slow death. We're trying to change the way you think about money. This is Gary Cassie, Fixing the Money Thing. Well, again, welcome to Fixing the Money Thing. And this story is incredible, as we said. Yes, and this happened to our daughter. Our daughter, Amy, about 18 years old, started getting what we found out later was a tumor in her body. It started, though, with pain in her legs, pain in her back, and uh, various different symptoms that she was dealing with. And so we were like, what's going on? Over a period of four or five years, we took her to different doctors, and they weren't finding what was going on, but the tumor continued to grow. And it grew in such a way that she looked like she was six months pregnant. And as a young woman, that's very embarrassing. She wasn't uh, married yet. And even emotionally, you start to think, you know, is everybody going to think I'm pregnant and, and nobody's going to want to marry me? So we walked this out over a five-year period of time. And, you know, the Bible does say through faith and patience, you will inherit the promises of God. But sometimes we wait longer than we should, right? Today's program is yes, about that. Yes. The, today's program is, you know, why wait? Because actually Jesus paid for our healing and you don't have to wait five and six years to receive your, your healing. But Drinda, Amy tapped into a principle. She began to get very diligent about the Word of God in yes, the area of did. healing. And she tapped into a principle we're going to talk about today. But first, let's take a look at this picture. This is Amy, just eight hours different. Eight hours is all we're talking about here. And this is an amazing photograph. This is eight hours, and here it is the day she woke up healed. She went to bed and lost 13 pounds overnight, nine inches in her waist, and was instantly healed. Her back was healed, and you can see she is a completely different person instantly by the power of God. Mm -hmm. Now, you say, well, what, what happened? I mean, obviously, she's heard of healing a lot, right, Drina? I mean, we heard healing, but the point was she enacted a principle that we believe that many, many Christians do not know how to, to tap into. We get emails all the time. People say, well, it's not working. How do I get it to work? And so we want to help you today understand how to do that and discover right. the principle that Amy tapped into. That's right. You know, Gary, when she was going through this, the, that tumor pushed all of her organs up above yes. her body, which is what was giving her the uh, digestive issues, kidney problems, That's lots right. of other problems with her system. But those, that tumor actually pushed all those organs yes. away. And you can just see overnight when she see called that. me and she was crying and she was like, Mom, you have to see God healed me. I immediately jumped in the car and ran yes. over to yeah. see. And we all cried to see that. And then our family got together because that tumor was so hard. If you hugged her, it pushed you yes. in. But, you know. You stand on the Word of God and look at the difference. It's amazing. It's still so, a miracle every time I think about amen. it. Amen. We took four weeks to teach this principle to Faith Life Church because we thought it was that important. So let's go to Faith Life Church right now and pick up that message called The Power of a Promise. From Faith Life Church in New Albany, Ohio, Gary Cassie shares a message with a promise. Why wait from The Power of a Promise series now on Fixing the Money Thing. How many years do you want to wait? How many years do you want to wait to have what the Bible says is yours? Uh, during the night, it was nine years, hand to mouth, in poverty. As believers, going to a church that taught us how God loved us, how he had great things for us. But our life was, although we had a great family life, we enjoyed you know, our marriage and our family, uh, we were struggling. Pawn shops were a way of life. Everything broken in our little broken down house, broken down cars, right? 
Anyone ever lived that way before? Broken stuff. So I don't think that's very much fun. Anyone ever had that kind of happen before? You know, it's not fun to live a broken life. It's survival. It's, it's living under great stress and anxiety. It's waiting for Friday so you can stop the rat race. You dread Monday and there's, nothing, there's no pleasure in it. And uh, so we discovered something. Discovered something that changed our life. When we discovered the kingdom of God, we were out of debt in two and a half years, began to produce businesses, enjoyed life. It was fun. It's fun to have good things. It's fun to, to have results of your labor. It's, it's fun to, to, to do things as a family. It's fun. It's not fun to survive. Just enduring, just kind of plodding along. So I wanna talk about that today. How many years do you wanna wait? There's a woman in Luke chapter 13. Let's turn our Bibles and let's discover that story. Jesus was in a temple there preaching and teaching. And this woman was theirs on the Sabbath, Luke chapter 13. And she had a problem. Luke chapter 13, verse number 10. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. A woman is there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue ruler said to the people, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days not on the Sabbath. Oh, really? The Lord said, you hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to get water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? Now, this scripture tells us something Jesus says these words right here. Should not this woman be set free? He is then going into a legal dialogue on this date, explaining why she should be free and could be free. Jesus adds these 18 long years. It's long to be in bondage. Nine years in bondage. It was embarrassing. There was shame. I remember one time I had to mail an envelope. We'd borrow money from anybody. Who would, you know, we, we tapped out everything, man. Credit cards canceled, IRS tax liens. You know, we owed money to anybody you can imagine. Hospitals, dry cleaners, whatever. I had to mail a letter. Called my dad. Dad, you got money for a stamp? His first sentence to me is, do I have to breathe for you too? He got, he's just like funding everything. He's like, we were the believers. We were the Christians of the group, right? Nine years of living like that. Why? Why 18 years? Religion has no answers. Religion is more involved in its protocol and formulas than it is about people. The synagogue ruler was indignant that Jesus said, should not this woman who has legal right, daughter of Abraham meant because she was an Israelite, she had covenant, she had legality with God, she had a covenant of freedom, of healing, for healing was promised in the Old Testament as it is in the New. Why shouldn't she be healed? Why does she have to live 18 more years in bondage? Why does she have to live one more day in bondage? So I would say to you today, why shouldn't you be healed? What are you waiting for? Why should you continue on in your life as it is? Why couldn't you? Why shouldn't you have what the Bible says is yours? Do you have to wait nine years? So why? Let me say again. Why should you wait? If you are God's child, you are filled with his spirit. He has redeemed you. He has called you out. He said he loves you. 
you have access to the estate. Why should you not be healed? Why should you not have what he's paid for? Why should you continue in your bondage? You don't have to. He's already paid for it. So who will enforce your legal rights? The woman in Luke 13, 10 had, what did Jesus say? She is a daughter of Abraham. And she had what? She had legal rights. She's a daughter of Abraham. She has legal rights rights. The Bible says you are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. You have legal rights. Who's going to enforce your rights? The answer is you are. You are going to enforce those rights. Let's look at Acts chapter 22 of a story. Paul is preaching. He's in a city, and as he's preaching, the Jews get upset when he says that God is accepting the Gentiles. They go into a tizzy. As you know, the Jews did not believe the Gentiles had a right to salvation. And so they got upset when Paul says he was preaching the gospel, preaching this message of salvation to the Gentiles. Acts chapter 22, they began to riot in the streets. They wanted to kill Paul. And in verse 23, Acts 22, verse 23, as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust in the air, these are Jews, the commander, this is a Roman commander, ordered Paul to be taken into the barracks. The Romans were like, what is going on out there in the streets? There's a riot going on. What is going on? There's this guy out here named Paul. They drag him into the barracks, and they directed that he be flogged, that means whipped, and questioned in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this, and they stretched him out to flog him. And Paul said, everyone say the word said. Paul said to the centurion standing there, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't ever even been found guilty? Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who's not been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it, what are you going to do? This man's a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and said, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, Paul said. Then the commander said, I had to pay a big price for my citizenship. Paul says, I was born a citizen. Those who are about to question him, these next two words, I want you to circle, underline. Those who are about to flog him did what? Withdrew, help me out, immediately. Immediately withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. Now, the parallel of this story is the Bible says you have an adversary, this woman that had been bent over for 18 years, the Bible says Satan had bound her illegally. She had covenant legally she could be free. The Bible says that if we submit to God, the devil will flee from us in terror. The Bible says resist him and he shall flee from you in terror. The Greek literally means to run from you in terror. So how did Paul escape the flogging? He knew his legal rights. He said, wait a minute, stop. This is not legal. It is not legal that you flog me. And so the Jews, the first, the commander, the Roman commander, took him back into the barracks. The Jews were all upset. They wanted to kill Paul. So they devised a second plot to get to him. They said, okay, tomorrow, let's ask Paul to be brought to the Jewish court, the Sanhedrin. And as he's being brought to the Sanhedrin, let's ambush him and kill him. Paul's sister, her son, I think it was, or his sister, overheard the plot, came to Paul and told him what she'd heard. Paul asked to speak to the commander. So he does, he tells the commander about the plot to, to kill him. And then in verse 23 of chapter 23, Acts 23, 23, the, the centurion, the captain there, called his centurions, two of his centurions, and ordered them, get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea tonight at nine o'clock, provide mounts for Paul so that he may be taken what? What's the word? 
safely to Governor Felix. Now, I want you to get a picture in your mind here. In one situation, Paul, who is a Roman citizen, is about to be flogged. The second situation, Paul, a Roman citizen, is being escorted by 270 military personnel safely out of that situation where he was destined to be killed. You with me? What's the difference? What was the difference? In one instance, he said, he spoke up, he knew his rights. Same person, same legality, but he said, he made sure they knew that he knew his legal rights. You see, we have a lot of Christians being flogged. I'm suffering for Jesus. I'm suffering, I'm enduring for Jesus. Well, you know, I'm just enduring life. You know, I don't know God someday. I mean, nine years from now, I mean, I don't know. I'm just enduring all this. I, you know, I don't know. Is he, God's teaching me something. Because they don't know their legal rights. And then we have people who know their legal rights. They're enjoying. See, that's what you're in. Nine years in bondage. We just didn't know our legal rights until we, God taught us. And then we go, wait a minute. Enough's enough. You know, if the Bible says it's mine, it's mine. I don't have to live this way. I have legal rights. Satan, back off. My body was sick. I said, this was illegal. God healed me. My finances are broken. Wait a minute, this isn't legal. This isn't God's way for my life. God prospered me. See, how long are you going to put up with it? Nine years? 18 years? How long do you want to wait before you have what God says is yours? The answer is you don't have to wait. It's already been paid for. Listen, write this down. What you know and do not know is life and death. Hosea chapter four, verse six, this is in your notes. My people are destroyed for lack of anointing. <laughs> lack of having a nice house. My people are destroyed for lack of having enough churches in the city of Columbus. Maybe. Because hopefully the church is doing teaching knowledge. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That's your answer. Knowledge. The lack of knowledge. People play church. They play religion. They just show up. Church is a, is a, is a moment of time on their calendar. They are not serious. They don't know their legal rights. They don't understand. Paul says, hey, wake up. You have an adversary. Be alert, be on guard. The adversary, the devil, is roaring like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. He is the thief. He kills, steals, and destroys. He is the author of everything evil and, and uh, of death and of sickness and disease. Satan bound this woman for 18 years. Wake up, wake up, wake up. You've got to know your legal rights. You may think you're surviving from day to day. You're being flogged. Well, I can put up with that. I can put up with that. I can do that. I'm okay. I'm surviving. There's more than that. There's life. There's potential. There's freedom. What you know and do not know is life and death. So let's talk about this for a minute. How's God going to build his church? How's he going to build your life? How are you going to build your life? Matthew chapter 16. Let's find out. Drend and I discovered principles. We found out the Bible gave us legal rights, how to tap into those things. Our life changed. We're out of debt two and a half years, built our dream home, you know, built companies. We, our life changed. It was a lot better to have groceries in the house. It was a lot better to be able to pay for the braces on my kids' teeth. It's a lot better to have a car that I didn't worry about breaking down with my wife at midnight with the kids in it, driving through Columbus. It was better to know that I had benefits and God's household, amen? amen? Matthew chapter 16, verse number 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is, meaning himself? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, but what, what about you, what do you say? Simon Peter said, you are Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. 
And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. The word Peter literally means stone. Peter was not the Pope. Sorry. The rock he's talking about is not Peter. The rock he's talking about is the revelation that Peter had that he was the Christ, the foundation, cornerstone of the building that God is building called the church. He is the cornerstone. On this rock, the revelation of Christ, that he was Christ, God is going to build his church. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, keys inferring authority. I'm gonna give you the authority of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind, say whatever I bind, not your pastor. It says who? You bind. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So understand this. Whatever you bind, heaven backs up. Whatever you loose, heaven backs up. You are the agent. You are the church. You are the agent of his government. What you bind. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1 that all angels are ministering spirits sent to minister unto those who have salvation. All angels. Jesus said I, he could have called 12 legions of angels when they are about to crucify him. So I could call 12, 12 legions of angels, he said. You see, heaven stands at attention waiting to back up what you release, what you loose in the earth realm or what you bind. You with me? How's Jesus gonna build his church? Gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. How? Because he's given the church authority. Jesus is gonna build his church on kingdom authority. You will have to build your life by using kingdom authority. You'll have to know how to release heaven, what heaven says is yours, into your life, and you'll have to know how to stop the devil from stealing, killing, and destroying your life. And the Bible says the gates of hell have no authority to stop the kingdom of heaven. So how is Jesus gonna build his church? Who's the church? You are. So what's he saying? For you to have success in life, you'll have to know how to use kingdom authority to build your life. So I ask you again, how long do you wanna wait? For Drenda and I, it was a revelation to find out what I just told you. Because we are people that waiting on God, waiting on God, waiting on God, waiting on God, waiting on God. We knew the scriptures. We led worship in our church. We attended a church that taught us it was God's will to heal and to bring prosperity and wholeness. We said amen, we shouted, we said praise God, but we were going bankrupt and I was sick. Why? Because I did not know that I had authority. I did not know how to exercise authority. I did not know how this whole thing operates. Nine years, I went through hell on earth when I didn't have to. It had already been paid for for my freedom. I didn't know how to exercise my freedom. And as a, as a pastor and as someone who travels and preaches and teaches, this is uh, epidemic, epidemic. How long do you wanna wait to receive what God says is yours?